Why you share the screen? Oh, it won't let me click share, man. I'm telling you. Hold on. The green button at the bottom says share screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. I mean, I guess it said it wouldn't, it couldn't share. All right. Can y'all see it? Yes, sir. Can y'all hear it? No. Nope. Gives are valuable tools. Yep. Every day in the church. You can't hear it? Yes, we can. Using them to work on energized lines, it's important to know if the jib has been dialectically tested. If it has been tested, you'll see a mark similar to this from the manufacturer. Also, your company might have a sticker or some kind of an indicator showing that it's been tested and approved for live line work. But why is this important to have an insulated jib? To explain this, let's take a closer look at the truck. The upper boom is only insulated between these two marks. So if an uninsulated jib contacts an energized source, this whole area becomes energized. If we were to accidentally make contact with a grounded object, it would create a second point of contact, which could cause serious injury or death. Okay, now let's say we have a rated jib. When it comes in contact with an energized conductor, this area remains isolated because of the jib's insulation. If we were to accidentally make contact with a grounded object, this area is now grounded, but remains isolated from the energized source. Even if you have a rated jib, if you have a winch line attached, it's not rated for live line work. So you should use a live line tool like this link stick to provide isolation from the energized source. Just make sure it's rated for the voltage you're working on. Remember, if you have a jib that's rated, make sure you treat it as a live line tool and keep it cleaned, inspected, tested and stored properly. For more information, contact the manufacturer or your safety department. <clears throat> Pretty good video. Yep. Short and sweet. Yeah. Hey, uh, can you add to it? Uh, not really. Not Just really. pay attention to what you're doing. Nah. Okay. So, I'll take that. But yeah, these um, uh, you have to consider your buck, your bucket, your working area that you're standing in, and anything attached to it as a live line tool. Um, is I'm assuming it has the same ratings, Professor Shoemaker, as our sticks would have. Yes, sir. 100 kV per foot. Yep. And it's very important, guys, that um, if you have a bucket with a jib, that is something that it should be examined, looked at really well before doing hot work, kind of like your rubber gloves, because that's, um, you know, that's the insulated part of your, your vehicle. And um, you want to make sure it's clean and waxed and um, in, in proper working order before you use it. So, and, and I mean, with do with things are going now, all the bucket trucks that they're buying now, even the small ones have a, um, a jib on it where you could, I could change out a transformer. If I had somebody there observing with me, um, with no problem with, as long as it's not over like a 25 KVA or something like that, but you want to make sure that just in case you have some kind of, you know, contact with primary or any other voltage that it doesn't, you know, go to ground through your bucket or, you know, through the truck itself down the ground. So um, very good video, very good um, things to consider when you're talking about insulated um, hot sticks and that uh, things of that nature. Professor Shoemaker. Yeah. It, you, I don't know, sometimes thinking, you know, you watch these videos and whatnot, what you see in the insulation as far as you insulating yourself or the equipment that you're using, insulating yourself from a live conductor, there sometimes can get, and you think in your mind is overkill. You're the guy. And I, you know, I kind of agree with the video on one part and I, I like the way they put it. But if you install a stick in your winch line and you install a strap on the conductor around the rubber hose, and then you're standing in a, fiberglass bucket that's got a uh, insulated liner in it and the bucket exterior itself is insulated i mean that's a ton of insulation right but even with that he said if my bucket touched the neutral that was below me you're at the risk and he said i do you know say risk of electrical shock so as far as that video was concerned as the animation was concerned should the neutral have been covered up also yes i mean you're you're adding and you're including tons and tons of insulation uh, protection up there 
which is uh, in, required. I mean, you would think, well, you know, I, my, I'm far away from the neutral. I'm using a, a stick in the, in the line to pick up the conductor. I'm using my rubber gloves. I've, I've got a rubber hose over the wire. I've got, uh, I'm in a liner in a bucket that's insulated. I'm on a boom that's on a truck that's 100 kV per foot. And that's probably what, about 20, 25 feet of boom sticking up there? Yeah. On the upper part. You know, right. you got millions of volts of insulation, but it's still required. So don't get in a hurry is, is you know, one part I'm trying to get at. If you go up there, uh, you know, I really don't need the hose up there. I, I've got an insulated stick and all this other pieces of equipment. I got plenty of insulation. Take your time and cover everything up as required by your company. Uh, the other part, what you were talking about before there is an, an inspection and whatnot, uh, every time, yeah. you know, every time you go up there, especially in the morning, you take that truck out in the morning, look over the boom, step up on the truck, look over the boom real quick, make sure you haven't got any cracks, scrapes, or anything like that. It looks relatively clean. It's gonna get dirtied up, I can guarantee you, as far as you're doing work and whatnot. Uh, Look at your rope on your winch line. Just take a good, quick inspection. You see any kind of any kind of defaults up there? I'll let your boss know and take it out of service. Yeah, be, be really proactive on the safety side as that is concerned. Professor V also brought up uh, cleaning your boom and your fiberglass products. Now, Professor V, we as far as sticks were concerned, our extension sticks, right. switch sticks, shotguns, and everything like that. We did an inspection and pretty much cleaned them ourselves and we were good to go. We did not test our, our sticks. Right. Now that's we, distribution. Transmission tested their sticks regularly and kept them in a, in a special dehumidified trailer. Right. What did Duke do? Well, uh, we, they used to send around a uh, piece of equipment that you know we could uh, run our sticks out and test them. Um, that was years and years ago, but now instead of that, they actually have some guys from the test lab come around and they actually just change our sticks out once a year. They take our old sticks and give us uh, refurbished or new sticks. Mm -hmm. It's been cleaned and waxed and just ready to go back in service. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what they do. And then we, of course, we all had spares. We had spare jibs at the, at the warehouse with spare sticks, spare, just about a bunch of spare everything that was um, where we had to do hot work. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as far as the distribution and distribution voltages are, are concerned, well, I'll ask this to the entire group. When you're using a stick in distribution voltages, which is primary voltages, do you need to wear rubber gloves? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you do. Okay. Everything, but, you do. everything but transmission. Everything but transmission. So you have two options in transmission. It's either live line work, right? We have to actually put hands on, and that's a whole different procedure and training path. But if you climb the pole and you're doing a stick work, do you wear rubber gloves? On transmission? Yes, sir. You, you wear leather for that, correct? Anybody else? Okay, leather is typically the preferred, or you can bare hand a stick. Okay. Okay, you can bare hand a stick also. For one, there's a couple of good reasons there. There is no rubber glove out there in the world that's, uh, that could be worn and work at transmission voltages. The rubber would be so thick you wouldn't be able to use your hands as far as that work is concerned. And a lot of linemen like to bare hand that stick to feel the reaction of the stick. If you got a stick that's got poor, you're going to feel it a little bit towards the end of the stick. The stick will sometimes swell or the hair on your arms is going to start raising up a little bit because of the voltage going through the stick and the stick is not a very good insulator. Then you know you're actually testing the stick while you're working it. Now, what do I mean in transmission as far as that's concerned? What do I mean by short sticking? Any guesses? Using a shorter hot stick? Okay, I'll, I'll show it to you here. Give me a second, I'll bring up a video. Uh, this, this is actually a rule in distribution also.
me see if I can get to it here. Okay. I don't know how many times I've shared this video. And uh, let's go right to the radar and you can see. Okay, we'll get a share screen going. Y'all see that? Yep. The Weather Channel. The Weather Channel. That's Live 5 News, buddy. Live 5, baby. Live 5. Five's on your side. Um, just always got to keep a clear head, you know? So, um, yes. Yeah, I mean, we'll, wa we'll watch the whole video. Uh, say again, Rob? I didn't say nothing. Okay. And uh, let's go right to the radar and you can see the activity moving to the north. Look at that now. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting to do this because I know it's... You guys can hear it better this way. Here we go. feel like a hero sometimes just the power goes out you know you leave your family to go out there and help get the stuff back on well when they first gave me that uniform i was tickled to death i know you know the word santa cooper shirt i mean that's kind of you know that's the big thing around here it takes a special person for this job a person that one and willing to give 100% most of all. A person that's willing to be a team player, a person that's got common sense. This is the job to have. It's a little dangerous, but you know, it's what you make of it. Just give your best, and the best will come out for you. Gotta be able to climb. Okay, I know there'll be a long gap between uh, now and when we come back but it would be a good idea. Whoever wants to volunteer for the next safety meeting out there is find a uh, video on pole chunking. Pole chunking or removing a pole with a chainsaw. That's a good safety subject. Yeah. <laughs> can't, can't be scared of heights or electricity. You really have to, to respect it. I really don't consider myself to be really athletic um, I, I'm pretty active it's a lot of physical exertion and it gets hot and you, you do have to have some kind of stamina to be able to hang with it the job is very dangerous um, especially like during storms or something I'm you working with high voltage you know 7200 volts you know, basically all the time. Um, just always got to keep a clear head, you know? So, I mean, yeah, it's dangerous. There's a good bit of training that uh, goes on for this. I mean, they give classes all through your first five years. I mean, it's constant. If you make a mistake, it might be something you got to live with the rest of your life or injure your people you work with, injure yourself. In the summertime, it's hot, sweating, you up a pole doing something. The heat can hurt you. In the wintertime, it's cold, you're freezing. You just have to be able to handle the extremes of the weather. You see, guys, I mean, there's no difference in a Lyman, Lyman, climbing. That's Josh Mackey. He's in Line Tech A. Then you guys are doing. You guys are climbing well. I feel it's real important in my community. Lights go out, especially in the wintertime, you know, freezing, ready to get the heat back on. You know, they're very appreciative about it. Santa Cooper is a very good company. If I, this was my company, if it was me, I would have changed the name from Santa Cooper to FC because it's a super company.
we'll get power out calls. They'll tell us the names and we know exactly where to live because, you know, this is where we're from. Approximately 2 million people. Okay, so now we're going to, that was distribution, guys. Now we're going to break into transmission, guys. And they, they do things a little bit differently. If they're doing hot stick work, they've got multiple types of sticks to use to be able to handle tools and whatnot. Okay, that's their stick trailer off to the left here. And they uh, lay out mats. They want to keep these sticks clean. And everything they're using as clean as possible during their work. But you'll notice what kind of, and these guys are getting ready to do some live line work. What kind of gloves is he wearing? Rubber gloves? Leather. Yeah, leather gloves. And <laughs> that's a typical thing that goes on right here. All right. I know I did it to mine. That's his radio number. So nobody steals his gloves. 509. <laughs> People receive their power from Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility, and it's... Okay, so we're working some hot uh, live line work here, and he's got, they've got the phases, they're going to take, change these insulators out, that's the plan right here, and they're going to take these sticks for support, they're mounted to the pole down here, take uh, a wrench, take the wire out of the insulator, so it's being pushed away with one stick, and it's being held up by this other stick then they change these insulators out. When you're doing transmission, you gotta uh, watch a lot on body position. So look where these guys are climbing, the sides of the pole. This guy's on this side, this guy's on this side, this guy's on this side, and this guy's on this side. You don't, it's, it's just gonna get into your mind of where you're working at. You don't wanna work anything as close as you, possible here. You wanna use the full, stick in your process plus this puts your body on the pole and closer to the face that you're working on <coughs> especially in the center right here so uh i mean i know it's a video but when you're working transmission work especially on this h structure that's the type of structure they're working right here i would say this is probably the whole crew and you got a supervisor on the ground that's doing the grunt work yeah yeah everybody's up there climbing largest producer of electricity. Santee Cooper's line technicians install, maintain, and repair power. All right, so if you have live lines up there, you're going to have to use nylon, insulated nylon rope. And you can tell by looking at this one, how clean is it? Mm -hmm. Very clean. Very clean. And it's going to have to be very dry yeah. while you're doing this type of work. Ours are dirty and wet, but we, we're using them a lot. All right. Uh, if if by chance the wind picks up or something moves or you need to put yourself in a different position and this comes in contact with the transmission phase is dirty and wet. Well, obviously, I'm going to have a phase to ground fault. So you need to watch your clearances a lot and use the right equipment. Power lines and equipment in difficult weather conditions. You see right here, they've already got the phase out of the insulator on the center right here. OK, and they're getting ready to change out the insulator. But you can see the amount of sticks that are used in this process and the rigging that they're using to hold things in place. A lot of stuff going on here. It takes a good, good amount of time. Yeah. And at all hours of the day or night to keep reliable electricity flowing to our customer state. Perfectly legal. You can sit on a cross arm to do work as long as you're safety off. He's also got fall protection behind right here. So he's also using a belt with a rope protection right here in case of a fall. He's doubled up. Wide. Line technicians play a critical role in Santee Cooper's mission to be the leading resource for improving the quality of life for the people of South Carolina. If you become a Santee Cooper employee, you will join a team of proud professionals that have served the people of South Carolina for over 75. Okay. We were talking to this is the point I wanted to get up to. We we're talking about short sticking right here. I, I know this guy, he's been working in transmission for umpteen years. He's, he really knows his business right here. To be able to use this wrench and get control, this is called a trunnion, to get control and take this piece of equipment off with this ratchet tool, you kind of get, get, get a little bit close, all right, to be able to control it and keep the ratchet up on the nut right here. But the more you move your hand up the stick, do you lose insulation? Remember, he's wearing rubber gloves. I mean, excuse me, leather gloves. What do we say the rating of the stick? 
Scott, what was the rating of the stick? 100 per foot. Yeah, 100 uh, kV per foot. The more you move your hands up the stick, that rating's going to be starting to go down. And start uh, dropping. I would, I would say, and this is a good guess, I would say he's probably got 300 kV of insulation right here. If he was using the full stick of 10 feet, you'd have 1 million. Now, this, what would he have if he has his hands right up there, like he yeah, went even he, closer? Right. If what he starts pushing, right. As soon as he starts pushing his hands up closer on the stick right here, your insulation value, voltage wise, is going to go down. So if you start, what would you say it would, it would be there? Be where he's at right now? No, if he like moved up, like you said, close to the top well, there. If you start putting your hands up in this area right in here, you're going to probably be around the 60 to 80 kV. He's working on a 115 kV line. So let's go here, here, and I've got my hand here. It's going to go through you to the pole. So this is the safety aspect of it. Now, like I said, this guy's got tons of experience. He knows what he's doing. He, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say anything if I was on the ground or anything like that. Look at him, do it his work. But I want you to let you guys what short, let you know what short sticking was. The more you move your hands up the stick, the less insulation value you're going to have. That's called short sticking but the better control you're going to have. So just be careful in your processes of using a stick, not only in distribution, uh, transmission, but in distribution also. Even if you're wearing rubber gloves, do not short stick in this area right here, okay? Two things. It reduces the insulation that you have in the stick to you, and your body is closer to what? Problem. Yeah, your body is closer to the line that's energized, okay? Five years. To learn more, visit our website at www.santicooper.com. Okay. Any questions there? All right, good to go. I got another video to show you right here because we were talking about it yesterday. So I'll reshare. <clears throat> this kind of goes into what we were talking about as far as fuses was, were concerned. And this is a great thing to know. I right, need to get this out of the way. All right. Now, we're going to start this video right here. What's the description down here at the bottom? Fuse feed. Fuse feed. What's it say? Seventy-two hundred. What's the first word? Oh, blown seventy-two hundred volt fuse All right. feed. All right. For one thing, voltage doesn't oh. matter. Voltage does not matter on a fuse, does it? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Amperage does. Okay. Right. Okay. This is this is our guy that we've talked about before. I'm going to start it right from the beginning, right here. For one thing, he says it's blown. Well. Let's watch this. Now this door is actually hot. Okay, what does he call the fuse barrel? Door. Did he say now door? This door is actually hot. Yeah, that, that's an old timey. Door. Professor V, go back to the old timey days. Exactly. He used to call fuse barrels doors. Uh, when I first started working, we had to go to Bennettsville for a tornado problem. And the, those crews that worked up there in that area says, well, go ahead and close the door. And I'm going, what? Uh, uh, you guys keep it. And that's why I'm always saying it's not a crossbar. It's a cross arm. It's not a fuse. It's a fuse barrel. Okay. Keep your descriptions technically right. All right. He said he's got his leather gloves on. He says he puts his hand to the door fuse barrel right here. And this thing is extremely hot. You can actually see where the tag that's on it has melted out and it's got some heat damage up here. Hot. That's burning my hand right through my leather glove. There's a the house over there. See the service pole. Transformer. 
So now, first thing I check. See how shiny that pole is? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's ice. Checked on this all new installation was make sure all of our connections were actually crimped up in place. Now keep in mind, the voltage is good right now, 121 per phase. Okay, so keep, yeah, you keep it in mind too. Right now at the house, he checked it at the house, he's got 121, 121, 242, and he's going to the transformer to see what the problem is, so he's checking it out. So I take a look up and check this out. Okay, so the fuse barrel, and you can see this black kind of goo coming out of it right here. The fuse inside the fuse barrel has gotten extremely hot and is not blown. It's melted. It's melted some of the fiberglass insulation that's inside here, and part of the fuse is melted away. So it's become real, real loose right here. A blown fuse, guys, like we discussed uh, the day before yesterday, all of this probably right down to about in here would could be completely blown out of the switch. And this area going up into here is usually gone. It is destroyed from a fuse below. A fuse melt, on the other hand, is going to let you know the fuse is still in there. It's just come apart. So before he goes into it any further, the fuse is a part in the fuse barrel, but the barrel itself, because of all the melted gunk that's inside, is still conducting electricity to the transformer to energize the house. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much just hanging on by until you get there to fix it? Yeah, it's hanging on by a thread. But the big thing to remember here is, even if you see this hanging out of the bottom, the barrel, even this is if this is completely out, and you walk up to this transformer and you see lights on in the house, the barrel on the interior can still conduct electricity. Hmm. Okay, I've got 7,200 volts here. The fuse is a part in the barrel, but I still have 7,200 volts coming to the bottom of the switch, to the transformer, and that's being uh, converted for the house. So don't, don't just assume that a fuse out of a switch that the barrel can still conduct electricity. So I have discussed- so That actually can flash on and off? Say again? Is that why, yeah. is that why your power will flash on and off like with some yeah, situation yeah. like that? Yep, yeah, yeah, it'll blink off and on. All right, when we, we've talked about the fuses in a fuse barrel before, when the fuse becomes loose, what is the barrel supposed to do? Drop and then to do what? Open. Open. Drop and open. It has oh, been, wow. The load has been so high that the cap has melted or welded itself into the top of the switch. Okay, it's been so hot. So it's welded into place right here from the heat. That's why the barrel is not falling down and falling open from this slack fuse that's in it. All right, description, blown. This is not blown, gentlemen. This is melted. What causes a melted fuse? Lightning strike? Nope. Power nope. overload? Overload, there's the word, all right? I've got overload. I've gone over the rating of the fuse, but not so much as to blow it. And that's typically what happens when you see cold, cold conditions. This guy's up in Alaska. Is the load has gotten too high. It's gotten extremely hot, but not so much as to blow the fuse. It's just melted it. And I know you guys are thinking, uh, well, you know, man, are you picky? Right, Professor V? Yeah. Yeah, are you picky about things that are going on out there? If yeah. I get a, a person that drives out to this, and is having difficulties and he says, well, I came up to the switch and the fuse is blown. My mind is going, you've got a bad transformer, you've got a lightning strike, you've got a severe fault somewhere. <coughs> right? I'm probably gonna go ahead and say, hey, what size transformer do you have? I'll get one loaded up. This was a 15, okay? If the guy calls me up and says, well, I came up to the transformer and it was melted out. Remember all that math work that we did before? about how to figure out 
the load on a transformer and the KVA size, I'm going to go a whole di another different direction as far as the repair work. So be descript when you come to something and you find you're trying to troubleshoot a problem. This is not blown. It's melted. See the tail that cut out. Tad bit windy. The customer is getting full voltage through to their home right now. Power's on. 121 volts per phase. Okay, now we get a little closer look at things. Now this door is actually hot. That's burning my hand right through my leather glove. You can see the, the fuse link. It's actually liquid in there right now. She's in all that liquid and everything is melting through the tube right there. That's what's conducting electricity. Yep. She's melting. So he says blown in the description. Now he says he's, she's melting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Real nice. This is actually an older type door that has the tube attached to the uh, cat. I don't know if you can see that. It does something here. We'll into stop the it. Tube. All right, so we got ourselves a brand new cut out door. Get a little bit better light here. You can see the. Uh, okay, let me see if I can get it back. This boulder style fuse link has the brass tube. Oh, geez. Let me just get back here. So, and I know it's a little bit blurry right here. I wish it focused in this right here. In his description, he said he got a new fuse barrel. But the connection cap in right here, is he using a new connection cap? Doesn't look like it. Sure doesn't look like it, guys. Uh, to, if I've got an opportunity to get something new in place, I'm going to use the whole kit and caboodle. All right. As soon as I put a new fuse, there's your fuse portion. There's your new cap assembly going on right there. And they make different ones. You see how black this is? Yeah. You're going to be putting a fuse barrel back that's going to give you the same problem that you had before. If you got all this dirt and grime and charring right here and you put this back into service, it's just going to do the same thing over again. Right. Get clean new stuff. All right. Uh, this is bad. This older style fuse link has the brass tube. The fuse link actually screws into the top there. Got a new cutout door. You're probably not gonna be able to see much here, but I'll keep that rolling when I close that in. Uh, this also goes to, I'm gonna talk about, uh, and it's real quick right here. Uh, do all switches have a static whip? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You'll see here when he closes the switch. Watch what happens. That wind is really blowing. So what we're doing now, we're moving away from that transformer. It was kind of dark, of but actually kind of helps in this situation. We're going to try to close it from a good 15 feet away. All right. Did you see it? I'm going to come back here and go a little bit of slow-mo. Right, watch it again when it gets ready to close the switch. I know it's fast. Yeah, a little bit of blue spark that came off the switch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, that's why you got the scrubbing process and that's why you have static whips. Now he closed that and it didn't look like he closed it under load. Okay, that's all he did was close the switch and you saw that little blue spark. That's why switches have static whips on all of them. <coughs> okay, here we go. Right on. Power's back on. Seen the lights come on in the living room, so 
go talk to the customer. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Any questions on that video right there? New. Any ideas? Okay. And, you know, that's why when you guys are out there at the field and you say, well, I need something. Well, I'm going to go do this. I ask you again, what are you going to do? And you guys give me the correct information. And I, I don't know why crossbar and railroad tie or a cross arm. Uh, give a good description of your, your best, especially when you start working for a company, your best description of what you mm -hmm. find. Okay, and don't get out there on slang and all this, the door, come on, and in what you're using in your company. Even when you guys are looking at the pole, and I, I know I've caught you multiple times on this. Well, I need to change out the switch and you actually need to change out the fuse barrel or the fuse. That's why I go down in that detail while we're out there in the field. Well, I need to open the switch up. Do you ever open a switch? That's a question. Yeah. No. No. What do you open? The fuse barrel. The fuse, barrel. The, fuse. the fuse. There you go. You open the fuse. If you open a switch, you're going to. a trick question. Huh? That's a, that was one of your trick questions. That's not trick. Okay. That's I mean, trick. just the way it could be worded on a test. I could see how somebody could think mm -hmm. you're talking about fuse barrel, whereas, you know. Mm hmm. Okay. Now, when I say, I, when I give verbally, when I show those single lines and I say, I've got an open switch, that's due to a fuse barrel or a blade being opened, okay? I, I know you guys are thinking, wow, he's being super picky. But when you get out there, and especially if you're working with somebody on, you know, as a pair or on your own, and they're commu you're communicating back and forth, one, it's gonna save you a ton of time if you get a good description of what you need or they need. And two is, if you gotta have something delivered, and you give a poor description of what you need for yourself and it gets there, well, that's not really what I needed. Boy, you're gonna catch the heat. Yep. Okay. All right, so let's take a break, gentlemen. 9.42. All right, and we'll get back at it. Um, probably pretty dang close, it's one over. It's one over. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, we are back and we're gonna talk uh, more about fuses here. And this uh, relates, uh, one is to, you know, the general work practices as far as utilities are concerned and to your safety, all right? Uh, depending on the organization that you work for, Professor V, were you a fuse saving or a fuse blowing system? Uh, probably a little bit of both. All right, so we'll, we'll go through both. We yeah. had, uh, ours was a majority fuse uh, blowing scheme Right. It, we did have a couple portions on 34 kV that was a fuse uh, saving scheme, fuse saving, fuse blowing scheme. Okay. What do I mean by those uh, terms, gentlemen? Uh, I'll draw it out here on the board. You need to know this, whatever organization that you're going to work for electrically, you need to know what kind of scheme they're running on their fuses. All right. So let's call this right here. Let me get my. Uh, Line size, right? Few schemes. Now, in, in, in normal operation, a company is not going to swap back and forth few schemes. Because mm -hmm. That means they're going to have to re, uh, reprogram all their breakers. Once the, you go to work for an organization, they're going to have this scheme set for a lifetime unless they make a decision to change. And then all the linemen and all the uh, crews are gonna get uh, notified of the new fuse scheme that they're using in the organization. So there's two, there's fuse saving and there's fuse blowing schemes. Okay. Uh, it, it's out for debate, I would think, Professor V, between, you know, linemen and customers and whatnot, as far as what kind of scheme they want to run on their system. There are some benefits to both. There are some drawbacks to both, but it's, it's the 
scheme that you're going to be working with because that's the way the organization has got it set to be. So I'm going to draw a circuit breaker and a substation. I'm going to come out of that circuit breaker with my feeder line. Then off my feeder line, and this is the symbol typically you're going to see for a fuse, this little S right here, I'm going to call with a fuse tap. So the first scheme that I'm going to go with here is fuse saving. All right, in, in the fuse saving process, and let's go back, so just to refresh here. In my organization, the one that I've taught about before as far as breaker operations, what do I have in the breaker as far as operations concerned? We talked about it when we had the two count sectionalizer. What was the first operation of a breaker when I have a two count sectionalizer? Does anybody remember? What happens in an instant? Did the class leave? It might have. I don't know. Breaker uh, open, close. Uh, it does uh, open. Whoever answered open, it does open if I have a fault. Detects it, a fault. It detects a fault. All right. It's going to open, but what kind of open? Is it instantaneous or timed? Instantaneously. instantaneously. All right, that's an instantaneous open. And like we had said before, as soon as it, as soon as I have an eye open, it immediately closes back. All right, then it goes to what operation next? Instantaneous. Timed open. Timed open and a timed close. Okay, great. So we both know what I and T, instantaneous, then time. All right, that in itself lets you know right off the bat if you have a fuse saving or a fuse blowing green uh, scheme, we are in fuse saving. So I'll go through the process here of how we, why this is fuse saving when we're using the first operation is instantaneous and the second operation is timed. A fault occurs and whatever happened falls away within the instantaneous operation. So we both, we all know, opens, closes, whatever it was down here on the fault, it's cleared itself now. Is Once the breaker closes back, on the eye, I open, I close. Once it closes back, are there any, do I have all my power back on? Remember, this fell away to the dirt. Is all my power restored? No. Yes. All right. And whoever said no, and I'll go through the steps. Fault occurred. It's starting to fall away. Open, close. It's falling away. Is my power restored? Who said yes, Reggie? Yep. Why? Because uh, the fault is off the. The, the fault, fault is, is off gone. the circuit. Correct. The fault's off the circuit. In that moment that it happened, might have just burned away. Okay. And it closed right. it back. Opened, then reclosed. One eye target. That's all that occurred. One instantaneous operation, and the fault has fallen away. Did the fuse blow? No. No, it didn't have time. It didn't have time to, to uh, go away because the instantaneous operation of the breaker saw it first. The fuse did not have time to blow. All of my power remains on. Okay. That is fuse saving. So one, fault occurs. anywhere on the circuit. I have an eye, open, close. Fault, cleared. All power's on. Not 
Now, obviously, we see the benefit here. Did I have to call anybody out to fix anything? No. No, sure didn't. Okay. Uh, everything's hunky-dory. We're good to go. Here's the drawback. Did every single customer on this circuit, this feeder circuit, every single tap line and transformer see a blink in their lights from the instantaneous operation? No. It would have had to bend from open, that point on. Instantaneous open, instantaneous close. Did everybody attached to this circuit see a blink in their lights? Yes. 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 Everybody did. Okay. That's the drawback. All right, so when we ask on a quiz, components here that are gonna to need to be answered on this, fuse saving is instantaneous timed operations, fault occurs, eye open close, fault cleared, all power is on. That is fuse saving. I did not have to replace the fuse. All those steps have to be included. Fuse blowing. Breaker. Feeder circuit. Tap line again. All right, fuse blowing the breaker setup as far as operations are concerned is first op operation. I'll go ahead and spell it out for you. Is timed. I do not have an instantaneous operation as my first operation. So let's walk through the steps here. Fault occurs. Does the breaker open and close? My first operation no. is timed. Does it immediately, do I immediately have an instantaneous operation when the fault occurs if it's timed? No. No. Fault occurs, fuse blows because I don't have instantaneous open close, right? Breaker is okay. Fuse blows, that, that's it. Right? It sat there for you know a second, half a second, not instantaneous. The fault occurred, the fuse blew, it recognized it. Here are the benefits for you. Did anybody on my feeder circuit or anybody else attached to it, did their power go out? No. No. Okay, the only persons that were affected we're on this tap line. That's one benefit of it. What's the drawback? You have to change the fuse. One is we definitely have to change the fuse every single time. Good, good one, Reggie. The other thing is whatever happened here might have fallen yeah. away. So you could probably patrol this line and find never find a problem with it but I still have to replace the fuse, All right? I have definitely, once the fuse is blown in a uh, fuse blowing scheme, I've got to send a person out every single time to replace the fuse. So that's the drawback of it. And it's kind of, I, you know, I can, I can see the benefit in both directions. I can see the drawback in both directions. Just follow the rules of the organization that you're working for. Two, and this runs into the safety side of this, what do we need to get any time that we're working on a circuit? What kind of protective measure do we need at the breaker? Anytime you have to put hands on or you're working on. Got to get that work permit, Brett. Excellent. You got to get a hotline work permit. Okay. Now, do we get a hotline work permit when we're opening and closing uh, with sticks on a switch? No. 
that needs to be canceled, correct? Yes. All right. In in a fuse blowing scheme, be aware that I don't have instantaneous anymore. Right? It's not going to go. If I give up my hotline work permit in this situation they're here, I'm going to have infused blowing. It's going to sit here and it's going to grind for a little bit. When I say a little bit, rather than an instantaneous open close, it's going to work on it for a little while. You're going to get a pretty good explosion. And if there's a fault down here, it's going to last longer in a fuse blowing scheme. Right? That's a, that's a safety aspect of that. <laughs> If you have a hotline work permit and come in contact, here's a rule, and I will get deeper into this. If you get a hotline work permit on fuse blowing or fuse saving schemes, all are instantaneous, then open only. Right. Okay. Systems are designed this way. So if I have a fuse blowing scheme, I have a fuse, fuse saving scheme, Every time that you get a hotline work permit, automation takes over and the breaker goes to that all instantaneous operations and an open, even if you're in a timed fuse saving scheme. Okay, it does some switching around of the breaker, controls are changed. You don't have to be there. But for safety purposes, hotline work permits, all instantaneous opens if a fault occurs. Yep. Is there anything else you'd like to add there? I think most of um, Duke's is actually uh, fuse blowing. Fuse very, blowing? Very, very little, yeah, fuse saving. Okay. Uh, and, and if I was to say that, if I was to go to, uh, especially in an extension stick, using an extension stick, changing out a fuse, you got to give up your hotline work permit. Right. I would say be advised. Just keep it in your head. If you're working for Duke Energy and you close on a fuse, the first operation is going to be time. Yeah. You're potentially going to have a larger explosion or a longer arc occurrence. You know, if you have a fault down line. Yeah. Right. If you're in a fuse uh, saving scheme, you close that fuse, the breaker is going to immediately open and close. It's going to be a little bit of time, but it's not going to be as intense. Mm -hmm. as it would in, in another so just i mean that's just good information to keep back in your head now let's clear this and i'll tell you the situation that happened many years ago we had i'll tell you we worked a dual voltage system we had uh, a 12 kv 12 470 and we had 34.5 Okay, we learned just through observation and process, we had a breaker at a substation that was 34.5 kV. And it was purposely set up to be first operation timed. And I know we discussed this in a previous video here. Almost all of this circuit was underground, URD. So you know why we had the timed operation. We wanted the fuse to blow because underground is a permanent fault. It doesn't clear itself, all right? So this breaker was set up to be a time open, close three times. Essentially, instead of ITT, it was TTT, all right? Guess what happened every time we asked for a hotline work permit on it? Told enough. It was programmed, and this was you know you know done many many years ago, and uh, I guess, I guess just overlooked in the process of you know going from fuse saving to fuse blowing, and and breaker controls is every time we got a hotline work permit, the first operation was timed, then open. What's wrong there? It's not instantaneous. It's not instantaneous. As far as the rules, they, they caught part of the rules here. It had one operation and then went to open. That is correct. But the first operation was not instantaneous. 
you want that instantaneous operation first. N O T. Okay. And the reason why we found out about it pretty much is we were closing fuses and we were observing, you know, that took a little bit of time to blow. That was pretty intense. So we asked our substation maintenance people, hey, you know, when we get a hotline work permit, is it instantaneous or time? And they went out and investigated. They were you know, totally honest, came back to us and said, yeah, when you're working around that circuit uh, and you're getting a hotline work permit, the only thing that you're getting is a time to open. And we just asked them nicely, hey, can you make that instantaneous when we get a hotline work permit? So they went and reprogrammed all the 34 KV breakers. So we had instantaneous operation, first operation. So that was only, you can do a lot of things with wiring and relays. That was only when we got a hotline work permit. First op equals I, I. As soon as we gave up the hotline work permit, we went to timed, open, closed three times. The way it was designed to be in normal operation. Okay. As far as fuse saving and fuse blowing, it's essential to know what kind of system is running on your system. What kind of scheme is running on your system out there, All right? Uh, ask the company or ask your crew, ask your supervisor, hey, you guys running a fuse saving or a fuse blowing scheme. What is your procedure for closing switches on new or repaired equipment? Know that information ahead of time. And you'll, for one, it, it's a safety requirement. Two is it'll save you a lot of headache on outages. Professor V, anything else that you'd like to add there? No, sir, I covered it perfectly. Okay, so let me, we went through the steps on the video there for a fuse saving. Yep. I'm gonna go through the steps here that you're gonna to need to have now for the quiz on fuse blowing. One, as far as fuse blowing is current, first operation equals time. Probably should come up here. Let's get rid of that. Uh, erase this, add this. Fault occurs. Two, first operation is timed. Three, can anybody help me here? Fault occurs. That's the first one. So let's walk through the steps here. Right. And I'll draw my little line out here. Open. Oh, we clear? Uh, what opens up, Reggie? The Switch breaker or the fuse? The fuse. The fuse, fuse blows. OK. When you keep your breaker energized and you blow a fuse because of the first operation is timed, that goes right back to what we're working on, fuse blowing. That's what I wanted to do, fuse blowing. Four equals what? Breaker. Does not open. It waited a little bit. It waited for a timed operation. Does not open at all either instantaneous or time. It just sits there and grinds on it a little bit until bang, the fuse blows. <laughs> so those are the steps in that. Okay, where are we sitting on time, V? Oh, uh, 10, 15. So I gave you guys about 25 minutes of the fuse saving, fuse blowing scheme. Okay, so let's unshare this. Man. Stop share. Okay. Let's see. All right, Professor V, with the time we have here. Yeah. I wanted to go through the jack jumper. You wanted to go through the what? Load buster. Let's do those two. We'll have a review, and I think that'll wrap for today. So if you want to go ahead and share on that, and then we'll take a break, and I'll share on mine and proceed on. All right, hang on, take, hang on one second.
All right, share screen, share. Got it. Got it. Yep. This is this is the load buster tool. SMC.com. The load buster load break tool is used to switch equipment that operates at high voltage. Failure to observe precautions below is there. In serious personal. Yeah. I, I understand in the process here is it's supposed to work at high voltages, not meant to be used on secondary. I, I can understand that. Yeah. But if you want to include a statement in there, high voltages and high amperages. Right. All right, the load buster is exactly what it says in the word. It busts load. Okay, go ahead. ...injury or death. Some of these precautions <laughs> may differ from your company's operating procedures and rules. Where a discrepancy exists, follow your company's operating procedures and rules. The load buster tool must only be used for specific switching applications that are within the ratings of the tool selected. Yeah. The load buster tool ratings are listed on a ratings label attached to the chassis of the tool. Okay, what it says right there, guys, is it's just like all electrical equipment that we use is rated. So you just like your sticks or um, cutouts or whatever, whatever voltage they're rated for, you just want to make sure that your the load buster tool that you have is rated for the voltage that you're working with. You don't want to overload it both the voltage and the amperage. It'll be right on the sticker. Uh, it'll give you a voltage range that's applied for it, and it'll give you a maximum a load break in amps. Don't go over that maximum. Go. Prior to using the load buster tool, be sure you have read and you understand the application notes and operating considerations sections of the written instructions, because certain application restrictions apply especially with regard to single pole switching of ungrounded primary three phase transformers or banks of single phase transformers. Loadbuster, the SMC load brake tool is the original lightweight, easy to use portable load brake tool. It brings load switching capability through 34.5 KV and 600 amperes nominal, 900 amperes maximum to your overhead distribution system. Okay, go ahead and pause it there. He gave, he gave you a short description of what's on that yellow tag on the side of it. Mm -hmm. how, how high can it go in voltage? 900. 34.5 kV. 34.5 kV is the highest voltage mm -hmm. you can use it on. And what would now, Santarella, what's the maximum amperage? 900. 900. Mm -hmm. Professor V, get, get your interpretation. 600 amps nominal. 900 right. amps maximum. Yeah, 600. Yeah, I, guys, I wouldn't push this thing over 600 amps. Right. If it says 600 amps nominal, uh, that's nominal to means normal operation. Right. All right. If you want to push it to 900, it will do 900. And that really is, is telling you a safety range right there. It's telling you, yeah, 600 and below, this thing's going to work all day long, work great, right? If by chance the amperage goes up when you get ready to pull it off, it will do 900, but there is a lifetime on the tool. Right. You start breaking 900 amps constantly all the time, you're pretty much going to destroy the tool. Right. Okay. That Works by providing a current path between the upper contact and pull ring of a hook equipped distribution device. When operated, the load current is diverted through the load buster tool and interrupted. All right, guys, you saw before the first picture when it was engaged before with this orange section was completely down in it. It was hooked in the top. You know, current was still flowing through the switch, but it was ready. But now inside what it did, it, it actually broke the load inside of this tube right here. Now it did. It had the connection on this hook and you'll see these hooks on the switches that we have on the cutouts we have on the field. It'll hook in that hook on the top. It'll hook in the barrel eye on the top, guys, and then you pull down on it. We can actually, we've got one out in the trailer right there, and we, we come back from spring break. 
we'll get it out on a stick, a short stick on a pole and let you guys operate it to see just how this operates. But it's, I guess it's what a vacuum in this too, Professor Shoemaker, that you think it was the arc or? Correct. And uh, can you go back to where the arrows were? So you show the arrows of current flow? You want the first one? Uh, it had, <clears throat> right there you go. That's perfect right here. Now, to be honest with you on this video right here, go back even a little bit further. I know it was fast. He did it quick. And then he showed the red arrows afterwards. Go ahead, that's good. You ready to pause. The load buster tool works by providing a current path between the pause. upper. Okay, right here in this case right here, you'll see the current path is from the top of the switch through the load buster at the top to the eye. Now he pulls this fast and he pulls it correctly. I mean, don't, don't dilly dally with this thing. When you're ready to open the switch, open it up. But the top part where the stick and you see all that silver assembly right there, perfect. When you start making that motion, the fuse barrel will come out of the top of the switch and the current path will still remain. Mm -hmm. all right? It will not break load until you see, go to the gray part of the tube in the middle of the uh, load buster. Right here. Right down. Right in here. Right. It will not break the load until that is fully pulled down. So right. you have a moment there that current remains to flow with the barrel out of the top of the switch until you pull the assembly completely down. It breaks it in the tube. Uh, this one doesn't have it, but I've seen them before that have it down at the bottom part of the gray part of the tube. Mm -hmm all the way down at the bottom. Down here? Right. Uh, some of them have exhaust ports. Right. So if you're breaking an, an intense amount of load and it's making a small explosion inside here, it'll exhaust it out of these ports right here. It, it's not a you know, big old electrical arc or anything like that, but sometimes you might see some smoke coming out of there from breaking the load. For contact and pull ring of a hook equipped distribution device when operated, so that was fast. And you'll no, yeah, you notice now the orange part sticking out and he pulled it down real quick, which you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? That's where all the load was broken through the orange tube and below. Go ahead. The load current is diverted through the load buster tool and interrupted within. We will demonstrate operation on an SMD 20 power fuse, but the procedure is equally applicable to fuse cutouts, disconnects, power fuses, and fuse limiters with an attachment hook at the upper end of the device and a pull ring on the device's switch blade or fuse tube. For usual operating conditions, the load buster tool is fastened to a universal pole not less than six feet, 183 centimeters long, with the frame of the tool in line with the pole. Before operating, check for proper resetting of the load buster tool by extending the tool about three inches by hand. Throughout this travel, and increasing spring resistance should be felt. Yeah, guys, when you're operating this tool, you just like what he said right there, you just want to make sure you've got good tension on that tube. You don't want to see <laughs> that orange showing and it's actually spring loaded and you can pull it a little bit, let it go, let it seat back in. And that way, you know, it's ready to be used on uh, whatever application you need to use it on. When operating from a bucket truck, Stay at least five feet, 1.5 meters, below the device and in front of the fuse cutouts, fuse limiters, and vertically mounted disconnects and fuses. <clears throat> when disconnects are mounted inverted, approach the attachment hook from the hinge end, staying well below the device to be open, so excessive horizontal force is not exerted on the insulator. Okay, you can pause it there. Uh, what's the minimum distance you can be away from it? Uh, 1.5 meter. All right. Follow your company's rules. We had to use a 10 foot stick with these. Right. All right. So you got video information right there. Follow your company's rules. We had to use a 10 foot stick. Go ahead. Okay. It has an anchor, which attaches to the attachment hook of the operating device, the pull ring hook, which attaches to the device's pull ring. Step one. Reach across in front of the SMD20 fuse mounting with the load buster tool and hook the anchor on the far side of the SMD20 mounting. 
the Mode Buster tool should never be attached with its anchor hooked on the closest side of the fuse cutout or other device. Attaching the tool in this manner would have to the operator to the operator, but it could result in placing the make this engagement difficult. Step two, swing the Load Buster tool toward the SMU-20 fuse itself and pass the Load Buster tool pull ring hook through the pull ring on the fuse. The pull ring latch will deflect and, upon complete entry of the pull ring, will spring back, locking the Load Buster tool to the pull ring. You can pause it there. The Load Buster tool is now right. connected across the... All right, this, this takes, just like we're using the extension stick on a fuse barrel, this takes a little finagling. All right, don't be in a hurry. And don't try to muscle it on there, but it takes a little time to get everything just right. And if you need to, let go of it. Go up there and visually inspect it closely and come back down and re-grab the stick. All right. Okay, go ahead. The upper contact of the SMD-20 power fuse. Step three. To open the circuit, operate the load buster tool with a firm, steady pull until it is extended to its maximum length. Avoid jerking and hesitating. The resetting latch will keep it open. Generally, there will be no indication of circuit interruption, but minor arcing may be noted at the pull ring hook and at the anchor, particularly when interrupting load currents approach the rating of the tool. The only sound will be that of the load buster tool tripping. Step. When he said that sound of the load buster tool trip, and you, you don't want to get this fuse open part the way with this load buster, and it's trying to, the load's trying to go through to this tube right here, and it hadn't made that snapping noise yet. You need to make sure that you're going through that motion completely. Don't stop. Just go with it. Yeah, go ahead and stay there. Uh, that is vital. All right, get yourself as far as in, in a bucket. I mean, this can be used off a of pole too. Get yourself in a position where you know that stick when you pull it down, and it's pretty decent distance. Yep. That, that stick's not going to bump into you or bump into the bucket or be hampered by anything. Because if you go through halfway of this motion and, and you don't complete the motion, uh, bad things can occur. Exactly. And four, to detach the load buster tool after circuit interruption, first raise it slightly and disengage the anchor from the attachment hook. Go back on that and show that again. Load buster tool is raised. Raise it slightly and disengage the Pause. All right, you see right there. Raise it ever so slightly. And really, we we never raised it. Mm -mm. But you'll notice what he did with the stick is he rolled it clockwise. Take your stick and roll it clockwise, and it rolls right out of the top of the switch. Okay, don't push it forward. It's just going to come back and rehook on that top hook. Yeah. If you roll it out of the switch with a clockwise rotation, it'll roll right off the top of that top hook. Yeah. Go ahead. And and two, see how close the top of this cutout yeah. the barrel is back to here. You don't really want to push up too much because you might re-engage the, the barrel back into the top of the uh, switch there, and then you've you know, you've got a mess on your hands in. Yeah, yeah, because your uh, uh, load buster has already done its job. Yeah. You touch the top of the switch again, you cannot, you got to reload yeah. the load buster for it to break load again. So yeah, you're going to initiate a huge arc. Exactly. Detachment hook. When the load buster tool is raised, the open gap distance is reduced. Careless manipulation could decrease the open gap to the point where flashover will occur. Next, Bring the fuse toward its fully open position. Remove the load buster tool from the pole ring by turning the pole. This will deflect. There you the go. Pole That's flat. what I was trying to say. Right. You notice it comes unclipped from both. It comes unclipped from the top, and it also comes unclipped from the unclipped from the eye and the fuse barrel. Right. While fully open by gravity, it may be preferred to remove the load buster tool by rolling it off both the there you go. pole ring yeah. at the same time merely by twisting the pole after the load buster tool has been tripped and fully extended. To perform Perfect. this operation easily and smoothly, always roll the load buster tool so it rotates in an upward direction. Step five, to reset the load buster tool for the next operation, extend the tool slightly and lift the resetting latch with your thumb. 
With the latch up, press down on the inner tube assembly until the tool is closed completely so the trigger can reset itself. When reset properly, the orange paint on the inner tube assembly will no longer be visible. Check for proper resetting by extending the tool about three inches. An increasing spring resistance should be felt. The method of operation works equally well with cutouts. Loadbuster disconnect switches. <coughs> and most other devices with a hook and pull ring. Loadbuster tools manufactured after March 2003 are equipped with a non-resettable operation counter that lets you monitor the use of your tools to make more informed decisions with regard to inspection and maintenance. The operation counter is built into the Loadbuster tools silencer and can be easily added to existing tools. If you have any questions about Loadbuster tool, visit our website. Okay. Yeah, guys, I mean, simple tool to use. I mean, it's it's a great tool for when you need to open a line that you know is heavily loaded down. Um, if you have to perform some kind of maintenance, you need to de-energize it. Instead of dropping the whole feeder, get up there with your load buster and open those phases up. That's what it's made for, so good tool. Can you go to the beginning of the video? I will. Yeah, just so it shows the switch. Uh, all the way up to the switch part where it's hanging on the pole. Keep going. Yeah, switch. Show me a switch. There you go, right there. All right. So, gentlemen, how do you know when to use this? Do I have to use it on every single switch that I open? No. No. So how, Trevon, how do I know when to use it? Well, I didn't mean for you to run away like that. <laughs> <laughs> trying to think of the name of the switch. Do I use it in high voltage situations? High capacitance situations, high resistance operations, or high amperage operations. Anybody? High amperage. High amperage. We're breaking load. Okay. All right. Now, by your definition, whoever answered that, and remember, we're learning through this process right here. How do I know the amperage is high? I don't know. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I, how would I measure and find out? Amp meter. Yeah, put you an amp meter around the fuse barrel. Okay, put the amp meter around the fuse barrel, and it's going to move. It's going to say 40, 48, 52. It's going to move up and down what's being used on the line. All right, and that'll let you know if you need to break it with a, a load buster or not. Now, this has been out for debate for hundreds of years. When do I do not have to use it? What's that amperage value that's safe? Professor V? It's hard to determine. I mean, yeah. I would. it's hard to determine, gentlemen. I've seen in cases where I've tried to break five amps with no load buster, yeah. and it, it just boils. Yeah. Right? I've seen cases where I've broken 50 amps with a switch stick, and everything went fine. Right. So it's a decision you're going to have to make on, on your part. Uh, we did experiment for a while in cases where if we saw on our amp meter that it was around five or six amps and that amps was steadily increasing, oh. we weren't able to break those loads, even though they're relatively low. Right. The amp is steadily increasing. We try to open that switch, you'd get a get an arc flash and a big old ball of fire. fire would come out of it. But on the other hand, we put the amp meter on there and the amp meter was steadily decreasing. That would do it. Open we pull it. that switch open, there'd be no arc. So it, it's kind of, you use what your company tells you to do as far as the load buster concerned. Now, I, me, my personal preference, if it's 10 amps or more, 
I'm using a load buster. Exactly. Just from experience. I've seen 10 amps on a 50 kVA transformer, which I thought would be simple, uh, pretty much destroy the top of a pole. Yeah. So use the load buster as needed. Okay. Yeah. Any other any other questions on a load buster? No. Uh, pretty much every single one of our bucket trucks had one on it. Exactly. Yeah, it is a great tool. It's got its own box. Keep it clean. Keep yeah. it safe. Note the number of operations. Even at nominal amperages, it's only supposed to operate a certain amount of times before you have to send it in for maintenance. Right. Okay. All right. No questions on the load buster. I'm going to share a screen right here. Then we'll do a uh, review of things to come. This one's kind of cool. How long, Professor B, how long have you said the load buster's been around? Uh, it's probably been, we probably had that 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Whoever invented it, I know, is making a ton of money. All right, so what do you do in the case where you need to change out a fuse, upgrade a fuse or change out a fuse barrel or something like that, and you don't want to disrupt power? You don't want the power to go off. You're going to use what they call the jack jumper. Bam. So it hooks around and what kind of stick is he using? Ours are black at the end, his is blue. Shotgun stick. Shotgun stick, yep. So you grab the top. Usually it stays, we grab the top, hang it, then grab the bottom and pull it to the bottom of the switch. But all this thing is doing right here is making an electrical path. So you're able to open and close the fuse barrel, do whatever you need to do to it, replace it, whatever and power still flows from the primary through the jack jumper to the bottom of the switch. Now, it's, the reason why it's a spring is it can be used on multiple size switches. You don't have to get one for a small switch, one for a big switch. That's why there's a spring in it. This video is short. What kind of what? What that's kind of stick tool. was that? That's my tool. Is it really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Man, that's a lot going on. Yeah. That's the best thing to slice cheese. Yeah. <laughs> so the barrel's open and out. I don't I don't still like those sticks. What? Uh, is power still flowing? Yep. Yeah. Jack Jumper is taking care of it. Uh, it's surprisingly, uh, you wouldn't think that just a spring-loaded connection right here, especially in the amperage size, would be sufficient for amperage to flow through it. It works. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, man. Yeah. As well, always, we've said this on every single thing that we work with. It's got a voltage rating and an amperage rating. Check the jack jumper. Check what's on you, what voltage you're using it on, how many amps are flowing before you use it. Okay, so I'm gonna stop that share. What time are we holding right here? Uh 40. Do this in about 10 minutes. I know we've been sitting for a little bit. Let's take, take another 10. Yep. And uh, we'll have our review. Okay, let's see. We'll do a quiz review, get to it. Quiz as. Quiz as. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just go through the questions. We don't need to give answers here. Uh, it's gonna be quiz three, protective equipment. And 
uh, what's an ACI? Uh, what is an op automatic circuit interrupter used for? That's question one. True or false? An ACI in a substation protects and monitors. Stand by. Boy, this is nice and slow. Here it comes. An ACI in a substation protects the monitors from the ACI to the substation circuit breaker, true or false. The purpose of a substation circuit breaker is multiple choice. And I've got, uh, I've got pictures for this one. To blow fuses before opening, to automatically open and close with I and T operations, to sexualize small portions of a feeder circuit, to reclose a specified amount of times, no I or T operations. We'll go ahead and talk about that one because it's got a lot of things that are closely related. All right. Is a circuit breaker designed to blow fuses before opening? No. No. Is it automatically open and closed with I and T operations? Well, first we'll talk no. about the automatically part. Does it, does, do I need anybody there to work on it or operate it? No. Right. Does You're it on the automatic? Not if you're on the automatic. What? Question, Scott? No, I, I, I was answering what you just said. Did you say I was, you said not on the automatic? No, I, I didn't, didn't hear what you, the last thing you said. All right. Um, it's it, it automatically is. open and close. Does it do it automatically? Oh, that's okay. I think it's just, what? I, I, my hearing was gar it gargled. It was like cutting in and out. I, I didn't hear what you said when you said automatic. That's why okay. I got confused. Did you hear it last time? You said the automatic. That's all I heard. Does it work automatically? Does it work automatic? Yes. There you go. Does it open and close? Yes. Does it have both I and T operations? Yes. That one fits well. Okay. It's used to sectionalize small portions of a feeder circuit. No. No. Okay. It takes out the whole feeder circuit. And it's used to reclose a specified amount of times with no I or T operations. No. That doesn't fit either. No. Okay. The purpose of a recloser is multiple choice. Open and close automatically with I and T operations. First, does it have I and T operations in a recloser? No. Nope, this negates that one. To open and not reclose. Well, it's called a recloser. So is it supposed to open and not reclose? No. no. Okay. No. All right. Well, His purpose is to blow know. fuses. No. There's no fuses in it. It's to open and close a specified amount of times only. No INT operations. That one sounds good. That fits. That fits. The I'll purpose. That one. What? <laughs> I was just agreeing with Trey. Okay. At the purpose of a sectionalizer, mul multiple choice, is to blow fuses? No. No, there's no fuses in a sectionalizer. Detect a fault and open once only. No reclose. No. Mm -mm. Open and close automatically with I and T operations. See. No. Open and close specified amount of times. No INT operations. Okay. Let's go back to, and I, I, I'm not hearing any very good answers there. Are you, Professor V? No. No. Okay. 
What was the third one you said? Open and close automatically with I and T operations. Go back to what the piece of equipment is. It's a sectionalizer. It takes out a section of the feeder circuit. All right, does it blow fuse? Okay. We already got what that. What was the fourth one again? Open and, close, open and close a specified amount of times, no IRT operations. So let's narrow these down. It's a sectionalizer. So obviously, does, what was that, Trevon? I was gonna say uh, the sectionalizer, doesn't that one detect the fault and just opens and then the one or two count sectionalizer is the one that opens a certain number of times. Correct, and you will see it by a picture. I've got a picture of a pole mount sectionalizer right here, okay? A pole mount sectionalizer, let's do, let's take away the bad ones. It doesn't have fuses, so it doesn't blow fuses, all right? It doesn't open and close automatically. Remember, it takes out a section. And this is in the answer. It doesn't have I and T operations. It's not a breaker. It's a sectionalizer. It opens a specified amount of times, no I or T operations. No, it doesn't open a specified of times. It opens how many times? Just once. once. Just once. Last answer, open, excuse me, detects a fault and open only, no reclose. Yeah, that's it right there. That's it right there. That one fits. Yeah, that's the one that, that's good for underground, right? Correct. Excellent. Because underground faults are why? Most normally permanent. Permanent. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Wow. All right. The purpose of a two count sectionalizer is, and I've got a picture of it, pretty picture at that. Yeah. Open and close a specified amount of times. Does the yeah. sectionalizer yeah. itself open itself and close itself a specified amount of times? The actual sectionalizer? No. No, no. Oh. You'd have to have somebody there with a stick. Open, close, open, close. No, we, we don't want that to do that. Its purpose is to blow a fuse. No. No, there's no fuse in it. It's to reclose twice careful reclose twice if a fault occurs is there any reclosure on that two count sectionalizer switch no is there a motor opening it and close no. no all right listen to this one it counts the loss of voltage from the breaker operations and opens after the second loss of voltage yes yeah, it's called a two count sectionalizer. It's counting loss of voltage two times and opens after the second loss of voltage. There you go. All right. Now I'm just gonna ask the question. You, I hope you guys have got this in your notes or, or know how to look at a YouTube video. Describe in steps how a two count sectionalizer works. So those were the steps that I had written out on notepad and put on the video. That's going to have to be included. That's a written description of how a two count sectionalizer works. The purpose of a fuse is to stand by. Reclose after a fault occurs. Fuse no. blows, does it reclose? No. No. Count loss of voltage and melt after an overload occurs. Does a fuse count? No, 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 no. counting process up there. Open with IRT operations. So is it seeing instant? Is it doing instantaneous no. time? No, no, that's a breaker. Blow if a fault occurs. Yep, that's the one. That's Blow the if one. a fault occurs. There you go. All right, put your thinking caps on. I'm gonna make you think about this one. A blown fuse is caused by line equipment going slightly over amperage rating. 
phase to phase or phase to ground. <laughs> Breaker operations going above two counts. A blown fuse is caused by, what's the best answer on that one? Phase to phase, phase to ground. Phase ground faults, correct. A melted fuse is caused by, and guess what? I put the same answers in there. Mm -hmm. High intensity faults, solar radiation, heat from the sun. Fuse load is below the rating of 150%. Fuse load is slightly above amperage rating of 150%. rating is slightly above the rating it's gone beyond what the fuse can handle but it's not a fault it's just gone above what the amperage rating is for the fuse correct scroll down a little bit here true or false overload is a high amperage high intensity fault true or false 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 true or false a fault is slightly above load amperage ratings of the equipment, fuse, or lines. True or false? A fault is slightly above load amperage ratings. True or false? False. False. It's intense. It's very high. Lightning arresters. <clears throat> A lightning arrestor stops the flow of overvoltage. Next, next answer. True. Stops the flow of overvoltage. Next answer. Blows the fuse in a switch. Next answer. Redirects overvoltage to the line or transformer. Last answer. Redirects overvoltage to ground. Redirects over voltage to ground. Correct. Yeah. It does not stop the flow. Okay. It doesn't stop it in its tracks. It redirects the over voltage to ground. A lightning arrestor can, answers, multiple choice, be used to re redirect multiple strikes. Next answer is only two, is a one time only use after a strike occurs? False. That's not a true or false question. Multiple. Oh, multiple, yeah. Yeah, yeah. multiple strikes can happen and it can re 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 redirect multiple times. All right, let's get into another lightning arrestor question. In order for a lightning arrestor to work properly, it must have a line voltage, right? This is the line voltage, phase to phase, phase to ground, or a voltage rating of the arrestor. Phase to ground. Anybody else? If I know what my phase to ground voltage is, that's that's close to the answer. It's not truly. So I've got 7,200 volt phase to ground. I need to know what the voltage is. Can I put up a 20 kV lightning arrestor? When my line voltage is 7,200 phase to ground, will a 20 kV lightning arrestor be correct? Uh, be too big. Be too big. So I need to know what. I need the to rating. Know the voltage rating, correct. I'm gonna use an 8.1 kV lightning arrestor for a 7,200 volt line. So the best answer out of those, and that's why I say in order for a lightning arrestor to work properly, it must have a line voltage, voltage rating. Got to use the correct rating arrestor in that in situation. All right. In your own words, and this, you don't need to answer this. We'll give the definition for overload. 
line equipment or fuse overload. So give me your definition for an overload. And then give your best description for a line fault. Pretty much you can go by the other answers that you've already answered in there and know what to determine as far as your written description of a line fault or a line overload, liner equipment overload. Now, when you get to the line for line uh, fault portion of it, don't put face to face to face to ground and leave it at that. Describe the situation of when you have a face to face or face to ground fault. What is amperage doing? All right, 18. Describe fuse saving. By what we had today. 19. Describe fuse blowing. And 20. What tool is used to break high amperage loads on a switch? We just saw the video. What is it? Load box. Yeah, <laughs> So put that jack jumper in there. <laughs> <laughs> put that load buster in there. That thing is made to break loads on a switch. Professor V, anything else you'd like to add? No, sir. Okay. Uh, this will be, and I'll, you know, the weather has not arrived here. This will be another midnight uh, finish time, but I would suggest you guys get on it as soon as possible. I don't know what the weather's going to do to your internet or electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Right. So we will text you. I will text you with the uh, both video links today's and the day before yesterday, so you can refer to those. And Professor V and myself will also text you when the uh, quiz is available. Yeah. So with that, and just just one last thing uh, before we go, because you guys got a stretch of time here. Uh, not that I will be able to check them through the course of spring break. But if you guys wanna go ahead and start submitting, you, that you guys that have not uh, done this yet, your resumes? Yeah. You got some spare time, probably a good idea to do it then. Those of you that have submitted and have been checked off my list, you're good to go. All right. Professor V, without, if you've got anything else from you. Yeah. And guys, don't forget when we come back on the 29th, we're not gonna Zoom, that's a Monday, correct? Correct. And Mark Jones is coming. Correct. Thank you very much for reminding me that. We'll be on the field. We're going to be on the field Monday morning, and I'll send out another reminder of that. We're going to be on the field at 9 a.m. Monday morning. Of course, weather permitting, if there's tornadoes or whatever, we'll reschedule. Yeah. Uh, have your money ready. Uh, we've talked about this before. If you're paying by credit or debit, make sure your limit is up to the amount you're going to spend. And we will take care of that. It's going to take, what do you say, about two hours? Yeah, a couple hours. It's going to take a couple hours to get it all squared. And when people get their tools, you're going to have to put them together like right. we do our sets of tools. So it's going to take a little time. Yep. All right. Any questions from anyone? Yes. Yeah, so you take a debit card like at the field? Who, Mark Jones? Yes. He will. Okay. Uh, he just needs to call it in. If you've got the opportunity now and to get the uh, you can you can email them or call them. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I say now, anytime through, you know, if you want Friday or Saturday, he'll take those calls. Okay. Okay, good deal. Any other questions? Is there a drop box for the resumes? Yes. Where was that at? 231? Um, I'll double check. Okay. I think I put it all the way at the end course, which we're in really in now because of yeah. rain. Yes, the resume drop box is in ELW 231. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All right.